Good evening. Thank you very much for tuning in and joining our first Thursday night debate of Easter 2021. Tonight we're debating the motion, this house believes that we are witnessing a global fascist resurgence. Now the past few years have seen the rise of figures including Donald Trump, uh, Viktor Orban and Jair Bolsonaro, and recent polling shows Marine Le Pen in a relatively strong position for next year's presidential elections in France. All of these individuals and the type of politics they represent have been accused by critics of fanning the flames of bigotry and intolerance, engage, engaging in extreme nationalism and eroding democratic norms. And some critics have even resorted to applying the F word to them. But is this brand of politics, this wave of right-wing populism helpfully termed fascist? Is it instructive to draw parallels and make analogies between our own times in the 1930s? Has the word been overused to the point of losing all meaning? And does, it, and does its use in the modern day risk trivialising the horrors of yesteryear? This debate promises to ask provocative questions about the contemporary political climate, challenging us to think carefully about the language we use to describe it. To debate this motion tonight, we have four eminent guest speakers and two student speakers here in Cambridge. And I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker for the proposition, Professor Walden Bello. Professor Bello is a Filipino academic activist and co-founder of the group Focus on the Global South. He was jailed by the American authorities in 1978 for leading a non-violent non takeover of the Philippine consulate in San Francisco. He's campaigned tirelessly against the Marcos regime and is now one of the most eminent critics of the Duterte government um, condemning the president of the Philippines as a fascist. Professor Walden Bello, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosen. Uh, good evening, uh, Cambridge, and uh, greetings to my distinguished fellow debaters, Masha Gessen, Professor Evans, Professor Benguet, Isabel Hernan uh, Mendez, Hernandez, and Sam Rubinstein. Uh, the House believes that there is a global resurgence of fascism. I agree that for purposes of academic analysis, uh, it might be legitimate to distinguish between a fascist leaning and a fascist movement or a far right regime and a fascist regime or an authoritarian populist and a fascist. I am a former member of parliament and, and largely a street activist. And while I have great respect for academics, uh, those of us who operate in the realm of practical politics cannot afford to act as academics. Uh, for me, a movement or person must be regarded as fascist when they fuse the following five features. One, they show a disdain or hatred for democratic principles and procedures. Uh, two, they tolerate or promote violence. Three, they have a heated mass base that supports their anti-democratic thinking and behavior. Four, they scapegoat and support persecution of certain social groups. And five, they are led by a charismatic individual who exhibits and normalizes all of the above. When Mussolini and Hitler were still upstarts fighting to barge into the political mainstream in Italy and Germany, Politicians of the left, center, and traditional right dismissed them as oddities who would either disappear or be absorbed into the parliamentary democratic system. When Donald Trump uh, got elected president of the United States in November 2016, opinion makers, uh, with the exception of a handful like the fun filmmaker uh, Michael Moore, were taken by surprise but most predicted that the office would transform the unpredictable star of reality television into a proper president, one respectful of the customs and traditions of the world's all, oldest democracy. After warning before the elections of 2016 that he would be another Marcos, I wrote two months into Rodrigo Duterte's presidency that he was, quote, a fascist original, unquote. I was criticized by many opinion makers, uh, academics, and even progressives for using the F word. How wrong the pundits were in dismissing these personalities as flukes, another F word. 
as they were when it came to others like Viktor Orban in Hungary, Narendra Modi in India, and Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. Academics are uh, uh, often reliable, um, rightfully scornful of what they put down as loaded terms. But the consequences of underestimating the threat posed to democracy by fascists are not academic. It would be superfluous for this audience to be reminded of Trump's almost successful effort to prevent a peaceful transfer of power in the United States by systematically spreading the lie that he had lost the elections and in instigating a violent insurrection. For those of us who have not followed the career of our other persons of interest as closely, let me acquaint you with the highlights of their respective reigns. Five years and over 20,000 extrajudicial executions later, the F word is one of the milder terms used for Rodrigo Duterte, with many preferring, quote, mass murderer or serial killer. Modi has made the secular and diverse India of Gandhi and Nehru a thing of the past with his Hindu nationalist project. And Orman and his Fidesz party have almost completed their neutering of democracy in Hungary. The US, India, Brazil, and the Philippines were four of the seven biggest democracies in the world just nine years ago. Today, three of them are led by fascists who are determined to complete their transformation into non-liberal democratic systems. And one has barely survived a fascist determined effort to hold on to power. With 11 million Americans, more Americans voting for Trump in 2020 than in 2016, 70% of the Republican Party believing against all evidence that he won the elections, white supremacy now the guiding ideology of the Republican Party, and that party's driving force, now a coalition of angry extremists not averse to violent means of seizing power, who can deny that American democracy is in intensive care, despite the passage of the presidency to Joe Biden. I would like to stress three things at this juncture. First, the features of fascism come together in unique ways. If we are waiting for the ideal type fascist to make his appearance, meaning a reincarnation of a spitting image uh, of Adolf, then we will be waiting forever. Second, the key features of fascism do not become prominent all at once and may in fact be institutionalized only late in the day such as Mussolini's eliminationist policy towards Jews, which he only made law in 1938, 16 years after he came to power. Trump's willingness to openly overthrow the cornerstone of democracy, peaceful succession in power by a majority decision of the electorate was not on display until he lost the November 2020 elections. Modi and the BJP's incendiary view of Muslims were dismissed by many as simply rhetorical excesses until the BJP came to power in 2014, then began the lynching of Muslims falsely accused as cattle traders, followed by mob attacks on Muslim ghettos and the legalization of the social subordination of Muslims. The third point is that the closer fascists come to power, the more some of them feel they must put on a pretense of respecting democratic processes and values to lull the electorate into believing they're really not as bad as the liberal and progressive press make them out to be and evince horror at being branded as fascists. Leaders of the Alternative for Deutschland, AFD, have been trying hard to cultivate the image of responsible politicians who can be trusted to behave in a coalition with the Christian Democratic Party. Fortunately, just when they think they've succeeded, someone from their ranks lets the cat out of the bag, like Christian Lewitt, formerly the press spokesperson of AFD, who recently slipped and publicly assured a right-wing blogger on the question of migrants, and I quote, we can always shoot them later, that's not an issue, or gas them if you prefer, it doesn't matter to me, end quote. How can one deny that there is a fascist resurgence if one were to do even just a brief survey of what today's Western and Central Europe, which birthed fascism in the first half of the 20th century and has again become its fertile soil in the second decade 
of the 21st century. From having no radical right-wing regime in the 2000s, except occasionally and briefly as junior partners in unstable governing coalitions as in Austria, you now have two solidly in power, one in Hungary, the Orban government, and one in Poland, the Peace and Justice Party. You have four countries where a party of the far right is the main opposition party, and you have seven where it has become a major presence both in parliament and in the streets. It would be myopic to judge fascism's resurgence only in terms of its political successes. The spread of fascist ideas is much faster than the pace of its electoral successes and indeed seeds the ground for its eventual political success. Racism, white supremacy, promotion of violence, conspiracy theories such as love jihads of Muslims seducing Hindu girls to change the demographic balance all spread fast online, become normalized in the echo chambers of the internet and legitimized. Especially alarming for you in the West should be the fact that Holocaust denial is now more widespread in Europe than three decades ago. And that in the United States, one in four millennials now believe, believes that the Holocaust is either exaggerated or entirely made up. This inroads in eroding the collective memory of 20th century fascism's most diabolical crime must surely count as one of the 21st century's fascism's biggest successes. If you think I'm exaggerating, listen to the German police, which reports that anti-Semitic incidents in Germany in 2020 rose to 2,275, the highest since they started collecting data on mo politically motivated criminality in 2001. Listen to Charlotte Nachblock, former head of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, who tells us, and I quote, anti-Semitism has become totally acceptable again, unquote. Talk to the German domestic, domestic intelligence agency, BFB, which has made the unprecedented request to, to the judiciary to place the AFD, Germany's biggest opposition party, a hotbed of both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism under scrutiny as a suspected fascist organization. The beast is struggling against its chains in Germany. It has bared its fangs in Washington, DC. It has shed blood in the Philippines and India. Let us not repeat the mistake of the democracies of the early 20th century of hesitating to call that beast by its name. Let me end by thanking the Cranbridge Union for inviting me to particip participate in this evening's uh, exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that bold and thought-provoking opening speech for the proposition. We now turn to our first speaker for the opposition, Professor Ruth um, ben Gihat. Professor Ruth ben Gihat is a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University and author of Strong Men from Mussolini to the present, which I heartily recommend. The floor is yours. Thank you. So as Professor Bello said, democracy is in decline according to the latest studies of Freedom House and VDEM Institute, uh, up to uh, over 60% of the world's population now lives under some form of illiberal rule. And today's illiberal governments take you know, different forms. Uh, some are old school style dictatorships like North Korea with one party states. Others are known as hybrid regimes or electoral autocracies or new authoritarianism. We, we don't have a common language yet to describe all of them because they're all, each one is different. A liberal democracy, a term uh, that's been around since Fareed Zakaria publicized it in the late 90s, has been co-opted by Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, the democracy part of the term being very handy to keep EU membership and foreign investment coming in but uh, in my uh, opinion, a total sham, given that Orban rules by decree. So uh, as I argued in Strong Men, the, there's a core set of tools that liberal leaders have used to maintain themselves in power. 
and uh, propaganda, corruption, violence, virility, and they've been part of authoritarianism since the fascist and early communist years. So if we think about personality cults used, you know, Mussolini and Hitler, but also Putin and Modi and Trump, and even out of office, Trump's is continuing. The canons of them, they haven't changed that much since the 1920s, although the information technologies and media used to disseminate them have. And of course, uh, the success of supposedly charismatic rulers uh, of today at engendering hatred towards some of the same groups uh, that have been persecuted for a century from Jews and Muslims to migrants and gays is one reason many contend that fascism is indeed back, as well as the sight of actual neo-Nazis marching around in America and Germany and beyond. So why am I arguing that fascism is back? It's not back, sorry. Uh, first, uh, because authoritarianism, like all political systems, undergoes change. Fascism was, with communism, the a first stage of modern authoritarianism. And to refer to today's electoral autocracies, I'll use that term, as fascist seems a bit, a, seems a bit ahistorical and risks flattening things out in ways that actually I don't think are conducive to democracy protection. So for example, when Trump was in office, um, some people I felt were not sufficiently on guard about the threats he posed to American democracy because they didn't see him as immediately establishing a one party state and shutting down the free press. Um, if fascism is the standard and it doesn't look like fascism, people say we don't need to be worried. And in a country like the US, where there is no experience of national dictatorship and democracy is the default mode, that is a problem. So today we could have a repressive reality without the one party state, without a total shutdown of, of opposition media. But again, if fascism is the only, is the default image in people's minds, that, that is, can be counterproductive. So I prefer to call Trump and others uh, authoritarians. I use this term because it doesn't refer to a specific historical period. The second reason is that sadly, the threats that men, uh, these men represent, whether it's Erdogan or, or Orban or Trump uh, are, are larger than fascism. Um, so to stick with Trump, the people he surrounded himself with had decades of experience with authoritarians dating back to the Cold War, like Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, who worked for Mobutu in the Congo and Marcos, and then Manafort worked for Putin. Um, and, you know, advocates of today's far right, like Bannon, Stephen, Steve Bannon, are not only open admirers of Mussolini and, and Lenin, certain things about Lenin, but as Cambridge Analytica shows, or is, he's thoroughly a person of 21st century disinformation methods. So it's larger than fascism. And if we stick to what happened in America after the election, that very tumultuous period of November through January 6, the methods used to try and overturn the election draw from all eras of, of authoritarian history. Um, and I expect that this shock event, as I call January 6th, will crystallize the GOP's own evolution into a 21st century authoritarian party that uses a combination of disinformation, violence, and election manipulation to stay in power. That's the 21st century recipe. So first, Trump evoked the age of military coups in exploring a military intervention, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, Chairman General Milley shut that down. Um, then he attempted to pull off the uh, favorite 21st century despot trick of electoral manipulation. He pressured state officials to, quote, find votes, as in the uh, state of Georgia. And this, of course, is how authoritarians already operate and with Putin and with Erdogan, where um, election results that don't go your way become just another piece of information to be relitigated or denied and replaced with a fabrication that suits the false reality you need to maintain yourself in power. Now, Trump certainly channeled fascism in calling on his most loyal supporters and bringing them to uh, the, you know, the, near the Capitol, including extremists in and out of government service and to rescue him from defeat. January 6th was a, a, a leader rescue operation. And one insurgent wore a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt to make the link clear. 
And the history of authoritarianism, and again, beyond just fascism, tells us that those who feel their leaders are endangered can become extremely volatile. And here, Trump's personality cult, depicting them as a victim, matters. And this victimology is something that started in, in the fascist years, but is, again, much larger. It, it, it's something that m many, uh, many authoritarians have in common. So to conclude, we can find other examples of politicians who channel fascism but while being something else, like Salvini in Italy with the League. But calling what happens today in Turkey or in, in Russia fascist means, I think, we lose the opportunity for a nuanced assessment of what authoritarianism looks like today and how it works. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech. We now turn to our second speaker um, for the motion. Isabel Hernandez, who is a third year philosophy student at Newnham College. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, we have to be here, and I'm going to start with a quote um, from the 15th of March from the leader of the Conservative Party in, in Madrid. Um, supposedly a center-right party, but she claims on public television that being called a fascist means that you're on the right side of history. So her slogan in Madrid is freedom or communism, and yet she has done very little to distance herself from Vox, the first party associated with the far right, to gain representation in the Spanish government since transitioning out of fascist dictatorship not so long ago in 1975. Now, in principle, the far right is not directly equated with fascism, um, which is why we are debating this, but especially since one of its main features is its, is its affinity with authoritarianism, um, or in the terms that I'm going to be talking about it today, totalitarianism, because I'm drawing from, from Arendt, and many right-wing parties around the world, including Vox, um, have almost acquired a monopoly over the concept of freedom. So that's another thing that I'm going to be discussing today. And I will briefly read out a description of the way in which freedom has been used by the right and the left, but quite loosely. Right-wing people celebrate the freedom enjoyed by all in liberal capitalist society. Left-wing people respond that the freedom with which the right celebrate, which the right celebrate is merely formal, that while the poor are formally free to do all kinds of things that the state does not forbid anyone to do, their part of the situation means that they are not really free to do very many of them since they cannot afford to do them and they are therefore prevented from doing them. So this is an elaboration of G.A. Cohen um, on the classic concept of negative liberty from Isaiah Berlin, um, which is the, opposite, the, the absence of the obstacles to possible choices and activities posed by the interference of others. And usually all there is is forces from the authoritarian state. But I'm going to argue that the concept of um, negative liberty is somehow being used by um, far right parties to incorporate certain things which appear to be freedom to act without intervention. Um, so women, this is, these are all things that um, are said by far right parties, at least from uh, in, in Spain, they are quite common and they apply more generally to Europe. So women, women are not free to exist in public spheres without fear of sexual assault from ethnic minorities. This is something quite common in anti-immigration uh, parties. Parents are apparently not free to isolate their children from education regarding LGBT rights, feminist ideology, and quite ironically, sexual consent. Um, individuals and our parties are not free to express themselves, even when the alleged censorship does not come from the state. So this is the culture of um, apparently something called progressive uh, dictatorship or things that the far right is now complaining about, even when censorship is by no means imposed by the state. Um, it's also sometimes considered a constraint on freedom that individuals and businesses are not free to dispose of their money freely because they are to pay taxes. And more recently, of course, um, you're legally obliged to wear a mask, close down businesses, not be out of their, after curfew. All of these are things that, whatever we might think of them, have been 
considered constraints on freedom. And it is precisely, I think, this concept of freedom which has enabled the far right to distinguish himself uh, from being compared to a certain extent with totalitarian or authoritarian regimes, which liberal democracies, um, especially in the West, have been fearing, um, in particular really in Spain, since transitioning out of dictatorship. This was a bit of a taboo, but now we see that it's not, no longer appears to be. Um, so the appeal to the concept of freedom or liberty is not exclusive to liberalism at all, but it wouldn't be new in any way to fascism. Um, in 1940, Thomas Mann warned that if fascism ever arrived at the United States, it would do so in the name of freedom. In my view, then, the resurgence of fascism feeds on the influence of liberal capital discourse, whatever we might think about it, <clears throat> to gain popular support from those otherwise put off by the association of fascism with authoritarianism and an indeterminate concept of external interference where external applies both to state intervention and to individuals who might be considered enemies of the nation or people. This is so to the extent that fascism has lost part of its threatening ring, quite worryingly, and traditional liberal parties, um, such as the moderate conservative party in Spain, are now willing to band together with what they take to be against the more critical left the right side of history. Um, so in Madrid and also worldwide, the tensions inherent to liberal discourse resort, result in two ways of addressing the fear of authoritarianism. It's freedom or communism from the side of the right, democracy or fascism from the side of the left. Now I have taken these slogans from the pre-electoral campaign in Madrid, but they reflect, I think, the more general tone of the center and far right discourse worldwide. I try to expose the way in which the term, the first term of the disjunctive, freedom or communism, protects the association of fascist discourse with its association with authoritarian, authoritarianism. The question arises whether the second disjunctive, democracy or fascism, has also been depleted of meaning by its use in our discourse. For even though racism and minority discrimination do seem to prevail, few parties propound what we know as uh, one person parties or authoritarianism <clears throat> itself. Instead of providing examples where they do seem to suggest it, which I think do exist, I shall focus my argument on the way in which features of fascism come together as has seen previously discussed. So one, I think, characterization of totalitarianism, which might serve to bring out a feature um, that characterizes certain phenomena together that it differs essentially from other forms of political oppression known to us, such as despotism, tyranny, and dictatorship, and that it applied terror to subjugate mass populations rather than just political adversaries. And this is less dependent on the form of government, which we have been discussing, than the, on the political and discursive mechanisms. And it does suggest that this discourse could lead to more state intervention, at least including border control and legislation against freedom of expression. Um, and it doesn't require um, personal, personalized power or um, one-person parties. Um, and we might add another quote um, from Arendt, which I think is quite relevant, which is, that if in accord with traditional political thought, we identify tyranny as government um, that is not held to give account of itself, ruled by nobody is clearly um, the most tyrannical of all, since there is no one left who could even be asked uh, to answer for what is being done. And I think that um, the discourse of anti-immigration discourse denies this responsibility quite effectively um, and also uses um, certain elements to villainize ethnic minorities, immigrants, um, and even just national people who have been affected by economic crisis and who apparently now live off the government and take advantage of the welfare state. Um, they are almost like victims to be sacrificed to a system working in the name of freedom. They are almost like our super superfluous men. Um, now the right has been using the concept of freedom in the sense for so long and so intensively that I think it has been depleted of almost any determinate political content. But it can, as I have tried to show, help see how it might not be so um, useful. So does the second dichotomy, fascism or democracy, provide an alternative? I think it does in the sense that it enables us to identify 
the features which we have been highlighting that characterize both the far right and um, what we previously called fascism. And I want to quote um, Rob Ryman in claiming that to deny the fact or calling the, ter or calling the germ something different will make us resistance to it. The opposite is true. We want to put up, if we want to put up a good fight, we must first recognize that it has become active in our social body and call it by its name. And fascism is never a challenge, but, but a major problem for it inevitably leads to despotism and violence. And I think that if the right has trivialized this meaning so much that it doesn't even fear being associated with fascism, doesn't even need um, freedom to hide its affinities with things which, with, we, with which we may associate with fascism, then we should worry that they don't themselves see their full-blown implications for freedom, for democracy, for ourselves, and most importantly, for others. Thank you so much um, for that profoundly interesting speech. We now turn to our second speaker against the motion, Samuel Rubenstein. Samuel is a second year student studying history at Trinity College. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, now, it's been quite a tumultuous six years since Donald Trump came down his escalator and uttered that barely coherent, uh, infamous uh, speech announcing his candidacy for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Ever since, the indefatigable seesawing of the Is Trump a Fascist discourse has been completely inescapable, plaguing every op-ed and blue tick twi uh, Twitter feed. To this phenomenon of the fascist resurgence, analysts will, vary will variously add such diverse and disparate characters as Modi, Bolsonaro, Orban, Erdogan, and Duterte. They all, I think, have something in common, but they are not all fascists. It's easy to understand why it's so appealing to draw parallels between the fascism of the 1930s and 40s and the political situation of our own times. Uh, fascism has become a very useful byword for political evil, and it can therefore be very helpful to those of us who find some current geopolitical developments disquieting and unsettling. The problem, however, is that these parallels can obscure important differences between the current phenomenon and its historical antecedents, whatever they may be. Describing Trump, Orban, Bolsonaro, and so on as fascists omits certain important features that make them unique and novel. Uh, that doesn't mean they're any less threatening to democracy and to the international order than the fascist ones were, just that they're, they're different. It is consistent and I think intellectually responsible to contend first that we are not witnessing a global fascist resurgence, but second, that democracy, human rights, uh, the freedom of speech uh, are under threat worldwide from a relatively new phenomenon of nationalism, populism, and demagoguery. In the aftermath of the insurrection at the Capitol on the 6th of January earlier this year, uh, the former California governor, uh, and he's obviously renowned for other things, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, gave a speech that went viral directly comparing the insurrection to uh, Kristallnacht in 1938. And this example encapsulates my point that a liberal application of the F word prevents us from fully and appropriately understanding both the fascism of the 1930s and 40s and new political developments of our own times. The 6th of January represented an affront to democracy and to the peaceful transfer of power. Kristallnacht, on the other hand, took place five years after democracy was vanquished from Nazi Germany. Schwarzenegger went on to describe Kristallnacht as being carried out by the Nazi equivalent of the Proud Boys. But as Thomas Weber has pointed out in an article, this characterization of Kristallnacht risks completely overlooking the fact that it was a state-run operation. Then there's a question of scale. We can say that the 6th of January was a traumatic day for America, and we can even go as far as to say that it, risk, uh, it risked destroying American democracy altogether. But it still is not on a par, or anywhere close to being on a par, with Kristallnacht, which resulted in 30,000 Jews being arrested and sent to concentration camps. Uh, the inevitable truth is that when we invoke the F word, it naturally leads the mind to these images of total war, genocide, the Holocaust. And thankfully, we are a far cry from these horrors today. The wave of nationalism and populism that has characterized the last decade or so should be taken very seriously. And it does, of course, share certain characteristics with fascism. Like Mussolini, Trump presents himself as a strongman. The nationalists and populists today like to invoke an image of a national golden age, which only they are able to restore. They construct their nationalism in opposition to the other, be it Trump's comments on Mexicans and Muslims, or Orban's uh, vague references to a global LGBT conspiracy. Uh, today's world leaders, however, lack one of the crucial criteria for fascism. 
Next to Hitler and Mussolini, they are not particularly interested in military matters, and they show comparatively little interest in geographic expansion. Uh, fascism is inherently militaristic and expansionist. Japanese fascism uh, manifested itself in the conquest of Korea and Manchuria. Italian fascism was focused on the establishment of a new Roman Empire and the conquest of Ethiopia. German fascism was obsessed with the notion of establishing a thousand-year Reich and acquiring Lebensraum in Eastern Europe. Each was fueled by revanchist grievances. This militarism was born of a type of collectivism which today's populists, who are broadly individualist and capitalists, would eschew. The concept of putting the nation before the self is very old-fashioned these days. And even if demagogues pay occasional lip service to this idea from time to time, they're very unlikely to find a particularly large sector of the population who would willingly die for their fatherland. So until Trump marches his troops into Canada or Mexico or threatens to do so, I find it difficult to conceive of him as a fascist. He and the others miss out on a key ingredient of fascism. The world today, thankfully, is relatively peaceful. Uh, war fought between states is a very rare thing. In such a world, it is difficult, if not impossible, to imagine a fascist resurgence. Now, I say difficult rather than impossible because the F word might one day have more of a contemporary use. I don't believe it is uh, impossible outright for it one day to regain some of its salience, even though I don't think drawing parallels is particularly helpful. My aversion to seeing politics in the modern day through this fascist prism derives in part from my very real fear that one day in the future, we might again rely upon it. The word must not be cheapened through overuse. And although the world today is the most specific really it's ever been, and although there is very much for us to be optimistic about, there are some legitimate causes for anxiety. Uh, nationalism and populism may be a far cry from fascism, as I've argued, but we are relatively closer, uh, I think we can all really agree, to fascist resurgence than we were, for example, in the Clinton-Blair years. If we are to fear a global fascist resurgence, our eyes should really be on the Chinese regime, uh, which, unlike most others, entertains the militaristic and expansionist component that we found to be lacking in Trump and his ilk. We might also look to Putin in Russia. Um, but the question or the motion was about a global fascist resurgence, and few states these days talk seriously and unabashedly about expanding their borders. Now, depressingly, it is not impossible that in my lifetime it will be apt at some point to speak of a global fascist resurgence. But it's our responsibility to ensure that if the time comes, the F word will still pack a punch. Uh, and it is precisely because it might one day come that we should think very carefully before crying wolf. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. We now turn to our third and final speaker for the motion, Marsha Gessen. Marsha Gessen is a Russian-American writer, activist, the author of numerous books, including The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. One of Russia's most prominent LGBT activists, they've worked as a staff writer for the New York Times since 2017. The floor is yours. think we have sound issues. Okay, thank you. I thought the host was going to unmute me, sorry. Um, thank you, Joel, for that introduction. Uh, just to correct the record, I work at The New Yorker um, and I teach at Bard College. I do not work at The New York Times. I also do not consider myself an activist. Um, I'm, I'm a journalist and a, a, a book author and several of my books have dealt with, specifically with totalitarianism. So I come to this conversation from a slightly different perspective, which is that of having thought <clears throat> more broadly about totalitarianism for the last um, 20 years. Um, and on that note, I want to, I'm also in the enviable position of being able to respond to previous speaker, speakers, which, which is part of what I will be doing. Um, I, um, I do want to argue against first uh, calling uh, what we're see, uh, seeing now, uh, authoritarianism, because authoritarianism to those of us who write about totalitarianism has been a very useful term of distinction. And there are important differences between authoritarianism and totalitarianism um, as they were laid out by Juan Jose Linz. Um, and one of them um, is that authoritarianism is a regime in which 
the public sphere disappears in which every, uh, nothing is public and everything is private. The authoritarian wants people to stay home, tend to their private lives, and not pay attention while the authoritarian accumulates money and power. Totalitarianism in that sense is the opposite. Totalitarianism is an all pervasive mobilizational regime where everything becomes public, everything becomes political, and nothing is private. <clears throat> and so I don't think we can apply the word authoritarian to leaders like Donald Trump, or at this point, Vladimir Putin, although I think he was uh, authoritarian for the first 10 years of his rule, um, or um, Orban, um, or Modi, um, or, and I think this is an important um, uh, name to add to this, uh, uh, to, to this ongoing list that we keep reciting as we go from speaker to speaker, and that's Benjamin Netanyahu. And um, um, so if, we, if, we're, if I'm arguing against using the word authoritarian, um, I've also had some issues with using the word fascist. I try to avoid it for reasons that have already been articulated. The term has been washed out, it has become almost meaningless, and it also has a way of taking us down the path of, um, of sort of nitpicky arguments and very much of the arguments of, of, around the scale of atrocity. Until um, there's mass genocide, until there's violent expansion of borders, until there's violent suppression of dissent, et cetera, et cetera, we will not call it fascism. So in that sense, fascism, I think, a lot of the time is not very, um, very, very useful. And yet, I have started using the word fascist uh, in writing about Donald Trump, and I started using it um, at a specific point, which is when Donald Trump used uh, military force to disperse uh, peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square and Washington, D.C., and put on what I view as a performance of fascism. Um, and um, I think that uh, at that point, naming the imagery, naming the performance was extremely important. Why is it important? Because as, uh, as, as Tim Snyder, uh, the Yale historian has pointed out, there's, um, there's very little difference ultimately uh, between different groups of humans. And our only advantage over say the Europeans of the 1920s and 30s is that they, uh, we know we have that history to learn from. Um, and so I think there does come a moment to learn from history. There does come a moment to make those comparisons. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to look at what uh, previous speakers have looked at sort of definitional aspects of, of fascism, but I would like to look at some more descriptive, some larger scale um, identifying factors. Um, there's sort of the forces behind fascism. So um, fascism is very much a um, something that arises when politics becomes impossible, right? And this is something that Hannah Arendt wrote about, that um, at a point where we basically politics become position, becomes positional warfare, and any political statement is its only way of identifying yourself with a camp where politics is <clears throat> No, uh, politics ceases to be politics, which she defined as the conversation about how we live together, um, when no politics is possible, uh, when, when society is that polarized, fascism arises. She also, in writing about totalitarianism, wrote about mass displacement as, uh, um, as a major factor in creating the, um, the possibility of totalitarianism and at this point, she was talking primarily about Nazi Germany in 1920s, 1930s Europe. This is something that we're very much dealing with in the world today, you know, as is polarization. Um, another wonderful describer of the preconditions of fascism was the social psychologist Eric Fromm, who wrote about a level of anxiety, a level of um, of uncertainty about the future that is so great at certain points in human history that people want to hand over agency, to hand over their freedom in exchange for a, a promise of certainty. He wrote about this in, in Escape from Freedom. This is something that we're observing in all the countries that we have mentioned today. 
Fascism is also characterized by the politics of resentment, um, the sort of the victimhood status that uh, the previous speakers have, have mentioned. And this is something that we're watching, that we're seeing all over the world today. And, and this is very important, Arendt again, identified uh, the Nazi regime as having uh, mobilized people who were entirely left out of class structures of society and left out of politics. These were the masses that she was concerned about. These were people who had not been participants in, 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 poli in political life before and who were pulled into political life by the appeal of fascism. This is something that we have certainly yeah. seen in the United States. Um, I'm sorry, can, some, can someone mute? I'm getting an echo. Um, thank you. <clears throat> There's often, I think, in the discussion of fascism, a kind of mistaken understanding of ideology as a concept. Um, but if you read contemporary, uh, people object that these uh, regimes are not fascist because they're not ideologically driven. But if you read contemporaries, uh, contemporary accounts of the rise of fascism in Germany in particular, you will see that people criticize Hitler for having no coherent ideology, for having a, hot po a hodgepodge and a sort of being a rhetorical opportunist. Um, this is also something that we're seeing today. So we're seeing all uh, many of these conditions. We saw them uh, as Trump rose to power in the United States. We have seen them in other countries. But what really concerns me and what, uh, and, and what animates my argument for using the word fascism in this conversation is that these conditions are still in place. Um, while we're seeing in the United States, and I'm speaking the day after Joe Biden gave his first uh, speech to the joint session of Congress, uh, what we're seeing is a kind of performance of a return to normalcy. But politics has not been reconstituted. We are still seeing a large, um, seeing the same level of, of, of polarization. If anything, it's growing. We're seeing a, uh, a large number of Americans who believe the big lie that the election was stolen. We're seeing it in their everyday decisions, the, um, the number of people who are refusing to get vaccinated because they believe that this is some sort of government conspiracy, I think is indirectly indicative of the extent to which our political life has been destroyed, or maybe directly indicative. Um, and so that, uh, that sums up my, my, my um, description of similarities and returns me to the question of why the word is useful. <clears throat> um, it is particularly useful now, I think, because we're talking about this return to normalcy and only a heightened level of vigilance, a heightened level of anxiety will keep us paying attention to the preconditions that are still in place. And in addition to polarization, it is that um, the, uh, the non-participation in political life of that very large number of people who are the masses mobilized by potential fascism and who were mobilized by the Trump presidency. And, um, and the final reason that I think uh, using the word fascism is both useful and extremely important is, um, is actually that the argument against it, one of the arguments against it, is that, um, is that it devalues, uh, it trivializes the tragedy of the 20th century. But I think when that argument is made, there's also, there's a, the, the subtext of it is that fascism is unimaginable, that the atrocities of the 20th century, the, the, the mass murder of the 20th century, uh, the, the darkness of the 20th century is so singular as to be unimaginable. And so anything that we're actually currently living through warning and reminding us that um, that fascism is in fact imaginable that these atrocities are not only not unimaginable but are very much a function either we're capable of them as humans and they're a function of our modern age and I think using the word fascism 
insisting on using the, the lessons of the 20th century serves as a reminder of the imaginability and the, ever, the, the always possibility of fascism. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. We now turn to our third and final speaker against the motion, um, Professor Sir Richard Evans. Professor Evans was the Regis Professor of History at this university from 2008 until 2014, and was also the president of Wolfson College. Um, he's the author of the Third Reich Trilogy and one of the foremost historians of Nazi Germany, Professor the floor is yours. Right. Um, well, th this has been a very interesting discussion uh, with quite a lot of points on the proposed side actually supporting the opposition. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, it, there's a number of reasons why it's wrong, in my view, to regard Trump, Bolsonaro, and the rest of them as uh, fascists. The first is that fascism emerged from World War I and was fundamentally militaristic. And as Sam has already pointed out, it aimed in the first place to wage war on other countries, to invade, conquer, and enlarge whatever territory uh, it was located in. So Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, Greece, uh, North Africa, Hitler invaded Poland, and so on. I don't need to stress this, but these kinds of invasions were um, in many ways genocidal as well. The Nazis planned to exterminate between 30 million and 45 million what they called Slavs, the inhabitants of Eastern and East Central Europe. Mussolini launched a genocidal invasion using poison gas of Ethiopia, uh, and uh, and so on. And by by contrast, uh, Trump, I think in particular, was and is an isolationist. Um, of course, today's strongmen are nationalists, but their nationalism is directed mostly against minorities inwards and not outwards against other countries, as was in the case with the fascists. But militarism doesn't just mean foreign aggression. Uh, Secondly, it's difficult to regard today's strong men as militarists in the sense of Mussolini, Hitler, and the other fascists. To th for them, militarism meant putting the whole country into uniform, regimenting, drilling the entire population, disciplining them into camps, which even students and teachers had to attend, eliminating the individual interests in the interests of the collective. Of course, fascists indulge in the cult of the heroic individual, but ordinary citizens are supposed to subordinate themselves to uh, the heroic uh, image of men like Hitler and Mussolini. The fascist state sought to establish total control over its citizens and not to be allowed any individual initiative in politics or any other walk of life. It's the exact opposite of freeing them from control. And uh, as has already been said, um, fascism sought to abolish the private sphere, whereas today's uh, strong men seek to abolish the public sphere. And there are really very stark differences there, I think. Trump and other contemporary populists have preached the, the, the freedom of the individual from government interference. Robert Lai, a uh, leading Nazi in the Third Reich, said, uh, people in this, uh, in this country now are never free unless they are asleep. And even that uh, wasn't exactly true. It's a wonderful book, a collection of people's dreams, which are strongly affected by the fascist regime. So it's very different. I mean, I mean the idea of far-right militias in the US putting on military uniforms like the Nazi stormtroopers and goose stepping down Pennsylvania Avenue is absolutely absurd. It, it points up the vast gulf that, separate, gulf that separates groups like the Proud Boys from uniformed thugs like the SS. Today's authoritarian regimes don't interfere in society so long as people don't violate their principles in areas like sexual orientation or attitudes towards the national past. Fascism attempted a permanent mobilization of the entire population, a culture of constant public acclamation. Fascist movements tried to create a new type of human being celebrated in the brutal machine-like statues of Breker and Torak in the Third Reich. 
divorced from traditional Christian principles claimed to be the foundation of political morality by Kaczynski or Orban or by the evangelical supporters of Donald Trump. The fascists often thought of themselves as anti-Christians, particularly the case in Germany. Of course, Mussolini was forced by expediency to compromise with the Catholic Church. But the new type of human being they proposed to create was worlds away from Christian models of charity and humility or the Christian ideal of the family. Fascism was overtly, overtly pro-science, pro-medicine. Hitler declared, I quote, in 1938, national socialism is a sober reality-based doctrine based on the sharpest scientific knowledge. And science, in fact, he thought, consigned Christian morality to the dustbin of, of, of history. Some leading Nazis were militantly anti-Christian, Rosenberg, Himmler, Schirach. After the failure of its attempt in the first years of power to create a synthesis of Protestant Christianity and Germanic racism, the Nazi regime turned against the churches and SS men and Nazis came under huge pressure to leave the church. Instead of God, the Nazis believed in the so-called Aryan race, whose perceived interests had to determine everything, pushing aside traditional Christian ideas of sexual and social morality, mentally ill, the handicapped, sterilized, and then gassed actions which horrified the Catholic Church. So racial science, so-called, was at the center of Nazi ideology. Huge sums of money were, were poured into it. The power the medical profession wield was uh, enormous. Uh, these regimes went to great lengths to create a fit and healthy population. Almost everybody was obliged to engage in gymnastics and other kinds of physical exercise every day. Fascism's aim of creating a new type of human was to be fulfilled not least by following key precepts of what counted then as scientific medicine. Now, the attitude of today's strong men and authoritarians and populist leaders to medicine and science stands in stark contrast. Backed by evangelical Christians who rely on faith rather than reason, Trump encouraged climate skepticism, cast doubt on the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic, refused to listen to his medical advisors, promoted quack remedies in his communications with the public. Much the same can be said of Bolsonaro. It has even had pale, sort of faint echoes in the way in which Boris Johnson has mishandled at least the first phase of the pandemic in this country. This is populism in which scientists, educationalists, judges, and other expert professionals are dismissed as part of the elites whose mission it is for the people and their chosen leader to destroy. <coughs> now, Trump and populists like him identify themselves with the people so that if they're not elected, it must be because the people have been cheated, not because they voted against them. Constitutions and electoral systems in their view, are just tools of elite rule in which the leader is right to ignore because he's a direct representative of the people who are, of course, constructed by the leader's imagination as those who agree with them. Populism of this kind elevates the leader above everyone else to the extent he believes he knows better than the experts who've spent decades studying infectious diseases or global warming, climate change, and thinking about how to deal with them. Fascism ruled in collaboration with the elites. Today's strongmen pit themselves against them. In my view, I think the, it's really important to fight today's threat to democracy, which nobody here is denying. It's important to notice. With, uh, it's a fight, fight the threat to democracy across the world. And again, nobody's denying this is a global problem, but we have to fight it with today's weapons. We have to realize what it is. We can't go back a century, and it is a century now, to the fascist threat to democracy and try and uh, reinvent the wheel of history, as it were. It's a relatively new problem, which is fake news, misinformation, science skepticism, and it's spread by the internet and the social media. It's a very modern kind of threat. We can't just look back to the armory of anti-fascist strategies, not least because they failed. We need new tactics and new strategies, and we need to focus, I think, on communication. The traditional gatekeepers of opinion formation, newspaper and magazine editors, publishers, radio, TV producers, and the like, have all been bypassed by the internet and by social media. 
these things, these, these tools of communication allow anyone to say anything, no matter how dangerous or how irrational or how unsupported by any kind of credible evidence. We've begun to find ways of dealing with this threat, but I think there's a very long way to go. We cannot fight today's threat to democracy with the tools of yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Evans, for that fabulous closing speech. And we are incredibly grateful to all of our speakers um, for sharing their perspective with us tonight. Thank you to you in the audience for tuning in. A quick reminder that you can vote using the link below. Um, and of course, we will announce the result of the votes on social media later on. Looking ahead to the coming week, we've got a packed schedule, including um, panels exploring sex work, the Windrush scandal and the Arab Spring, and solo speakers, including Harvard Stephen Pinker and Lord Alan Sugar. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.